Hello, I'm John Cam, and I'm here in Barcelona at the European Heart Rhythm Association meeting 2018. We're getting towards the end of the first day and it's been very hectic and very exciting. With me to talk to about the day, Paulus Kirchhoff from Birmingham in the United Kingdom and Karina Blomström Lundqvist from Uppsala in Sweden. Paulus, why don't you tell us a little bit about patients suitable for a left atrial appendage occlusion device. You've been listening to a debate already. Yeah, so we had a really lively debate uh, with pro and con arguments and the overarching question was whether left atrial appendage occluders can be considered as an alternative to anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation at risk of stroke. Um, and the initial vote was split 30-70, so the majority of the people felt that they aren't. Um, both discussions actually made very valid points, including the bleeding risk on anticoagulation on one side, on the other side the need to treat patients with antiplatelets when they have an occluder and for how long and we don't know, and the bleeding risk on antiplatelets. The fact that we don't really have controlled trials that compare occluders with NOACs, and it was actually quite interesting to learn that there are at least five controlled trials ongoing, I think all of them in Europe, that will compare uh, patients at various selection criteria of high risk of bleeding and randomize them either to an occluder or to a NOAC. The outcome at the end of the debate was almost identical. It still was a 30 to 70 split. Oh, so no movement at all. So people are still not certain about what to do. I think there is a growing perception about the benefits of anticoagulation in most patients with atrial fibrillation and therefore I guess that's driving the reluctance to use these interventions even though they can be very beneficial in uh, occasional patients. But we've also heard quite a lot about patients who've had an ablation. They don't have atrial fibrillation anymore, so do they need to continue their anticoagulation? Is it really necessary? That was another debate, um, actually also today and here, and, and there were some fair arguments to be made that the stroke risk doesn't go away when uh, the atrial fibrillation is gone, not necessarily. Also that the recurrence rates are high, but on the other hand, that observational data suggests that the stroke rate in ablated patients is a lot lower than in AF patients who did not undergo ablation. So are there any trials on the way to solve that issue? Yeah, there are. Actually, there are at least three. So one is called Odin, like the Northern God is run in Germany. One is called Ocean, uh, like the Wide Ocean, and it's run from Canada with involvement in Europe. And there's another one called OAT, which is, I think, done in uh, Italy. Interestingly, um, that debate started off with almost equipoise, and at the end of the debate, more than 80% were in favor of continuing anticoagulation. So there was a real shift in I opinion think that's there. very interesting because personally I'm very much in favor of continuing the anticoagulation mm. until we sort out whether it's the atrial fibrillation itself or the underlying atrial disease, the so-called atriopathy, that's causing this stroke risk. You went to some other sessions, uh, yes, Karina. You've uh, been looking at I went ablation. to a session on AF ablation and mapping and the keynote lecturers were Nasir Marush from Utah and uh, Pierre Jays from Bordeaux. So Nasir was talking about the importance of substrate modification and ablation, and he described an upcoming trial, the CAF2 trial, randomizing patients between pulmonary vein isolation and pulmonary vein isolation combined with substrate modification with the help of MR to identify the scar areas in the left atrium. And Pierre Jays, he was talking, of course, about the rotor ablation, which is a very difficult topic because no one understands it yet and there are no randomized trials showing any benefit. But he was quite convincing in his uh, demonstrating that um, many of the persistent AF patients actually did better uh, after rotor ablation. And yet we've had some clinical trials which have so far not been very no, convincing. So, no, exactly. So we are lacking randomized trials and I think it's time to ask for such trials to demonstrate the benefit of it. Because in my view it may be 
requiring quite extensive ablations to find this rotor. It's not a point-by-point -point ablation, actually. Interestingly, we, we have uh, heard quite a lot in the mapping summit meeting here, of, of course, about mapping and rotors have come up there. Uh, a lot of new technologies and techniques are showing rotors, both in uh, isolated tissue, in experimental hearts, in reconstructed simulated situations. So it's a, it's a very hot topic at the moment, but we're just lacking convincing clinical yes, work yes. to tell us that that's a, a reasonable procedure at the moment. And I think there is still somehow the open question whether uh, the center of the rotor or the target of your ablation is actually stationary or not. Absolutely. Because if it's a moving target, how can it guide your lesion creation? Very much. Yeah. 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 And I think it's a problem with the previous trials, the way they have been designed, like the uh, STAR F2 trial, uh, incorporating linear lesions together with pulmonary vein isolation, instead of waiting for complete pulmonary vein isolation and then randomize mm. patients to the different yeah. options beyond PVI. Mm. So it's but difficult think, to draw conclusions. Yeah. On the other hand, STAR AF is a good illustration that randomized trials can open up the field again yeah, because absolutely. only one uh, the, only one eighth of the patients were randomized to PVI only yeah. but the main finding was that these patients didn't have a better or worse outcomes than yeah. than the others so unexpected I think to many and certainly to the people who designed the trial but still we don't know why yeah. we don't know why yeah. well uh, talking about randomized trials there was an awful lot of discussion about castle AF here in some of the sessions of course, it's uh, the, the first trial to really show that ablation of atrial fibrillation can make a difference, in this case, in patients with significant heart failure. But uh, there was lots of criticism of the trial. People are not quite so certain about the results. Relatively small numbers. And, of course, uh, a long time to recruit these patients. So who are they exactly? And the results of the trial also demonstrated that those who might think would benefit more, the more severe heart failure, the lower ejection fractures were the ones that were least helped. Yeah. So what's your take on that? Well, I think on the one hand, it's as you say, uh, at, at first glance, and that's an important message, there is a first sign from a controlled clinical trial that rhythm control therapy can have prognostic benefits. I do think, looking at the size of the trial, that the mortality difference, even though it was nominally statistically significant, uh, may have been due to chance. Um, but overall, because all the outcomes point in the same direction, it is actually reasonably convincing evidence that um, rhythm control therapy, if achieved successfully, actually may improve outcomes in those patients. The other comment that you correctly made is it's a very specific group of patients. They have a device, usually a CRT, so they all have bad heart failure. But it's only 20% who had CRT actually in the trial. Yeah, so. that's true. But they all had a device that picked yeah, up yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the... So I don't think we can generalize yet. And of course, uh, and I have to admit to some professional bias here, uh, we are still waiting for the final e events to come in on the EAST trial, which will test the same concept, rhythm control therapy applied early compared to conventional therapy in a much broader population of AF patients at risk of stroke. And I'm hopeful that we'll find out, and uh, I keep my fingers crossed that we can show that we can pro provide additional benefit by giving, offering rhythm control therapy to anticoagulated AF patients. At the lunchtime session today, we had uh, lots of questions and comments about the duration of atrial fibrillation that deserves anticoagulating. And of course, because of previous trials, and many physicians are taking this six-minute marker as being the type of atrial fibrillation that should stimulate us to use anticoagulant. I tried to uh, say to people that this was probably not the case because other analyses have shown that we need much longer duration of atrial fibrillation. And I know, Paulus, for example, you are heavily involved in a clinical trial looking at that. Yeah. So I think the first thing that's important to, for me to say is that um, all the evidence that we have that anticoagulation works has been obtained in patients with 
atrial fibrillation documented by ECG. Now, whether you document it with electrodes on your skin or with an electrode in your heart doesn't matter, but the monitoring frequency matters. So basically, those are patients who have very frequent episodes of paroxysms of atrial fibrillation compared to those that you pick up with an implanted device, a loop recorder, a pacemaker. And there is actually growing evidence that those with very short episodes of atrial fibrillation, first of all, they are common. Uh, 30 to 40 percent of them, uh, of patients who are elderly, will have atrial high rate episodes when you implant a loop recorder. And their stroke risk isn't that high. So that we probably have to accept, in my world, and we need more evidence, um, the very occasional atrial high rate episode is probably a normal variant and not a disease, even though it is a marker for something, um, because not all patients have it. But it's not a reason to anticoagulate at present, and there are two ongoing large trials. We will discuss them later during this meeting, even though we don't have the outcomes yet. Jeff Healy is coordinating Artesia, and I'm involved in one called NOAA, and so they will tell us. It's obviously all go. Lots mm. of clinical trials up and running. Yeah. We're waiting for some of these to report, but what a fantastic day we've had. The first day of ERA 2018. Wonderful day, lots of debate, lots of excitement, and lots of activity.